This episode is brought to you by Fully Gemstones. It's quite an elaborate affair. There were Nubians coming in with rolled up carpets and out of the carpet came Ruth Saint-Denis, who was the fabulous dancer of the day, doing her exotic dance. And they were recreating the scene of Antony and Cleopatra returning to Alexandria. It was quite an event. We don't see many pieces of Louis Comfort Tiffany from this Egyptian period that often in the market. So having one come up uh, is really extraordinary. Welcome to If Jewels Could Talk. I'm Carol Walton, the voice of jewelry, an author, broadcaster, and the woman who initiated the role of jewelry editor at magazines like Tatler and British Vogue. This is a podcast for everyone, for people who do like jewelry, for people who don't realize they like jewelry, and anyone intrigued by fascinating facts, new ideas, and forgotten histories. So please join me as I tell sparkly tales, meeting all sorts of people, delving into four centuries of jewellery culture and investigate what's happening now. We'll be streaming our episode of Sustainability in Fashion and Jewellery in the new year. In the meantime, we'll be devoting the next two episodes to the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb, which was a hundred years ago this week. Ancient Egypt has obsessed the imagination of the West ever since archaeologists began uncovering jewels from this exotic civilization. But the discovery of this tomb is extraordinary. It was in the summer of 1922 when Lord Carnarvon was deciding whether or not to allow archaeologist Howard Carter one last season of excavation in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. Up until that point, Lord Carnarvon had spent between five or six million pounds in his quest and had been disappointed. But he decided to give Howard Carter one last roll of the dice. Carter went back to Egypt and he and his team were excavating in front of the tomb of Ramesses VII. It was hot work, hot and dusty, and water boys came frequently with great big stone urns of water to keep everyone hydrated. And one water boy put down his great big flagon and felt something hard underneath. Turned out to be a stone step. And from there, they uncovered stairs leading down into Tutankhamun's tomb. Now, there have been many revivals of Egyptian jewellery. When Napoleon stormed the country in the 18th century, Egypt mania ran riot in Europe in architecture, decorative arts and jewellery. In 1869, there was the opening of the Suez Canal, which brought a resurgence of sphinxes, pyramids and papyrus leaves and scarabs in everything, fashion, decorative arts and jewels. But The most pervasive period of Egyptian influence undoubtedly came when Art Deco coincided with the discovery of King Tut's tomb. These magnificent treasures were then unveiled to the world for the first time and fine jewellery houses like Cartier, Van Cleef and Arpels and Tiffany began producing fine jewellery in line with King Tut mania. And I'm delighted to have Carol Elkins with me today, the Senior Vice President of Sotheby's Jewellery in New York, who on this anniversary of the most spectacular archaeological event of the 20th century is showcasing at Sotheby's a collection of Egyptian themed jewels spanning from the 19th century to today. So firstly, Carol, thank you so much for joining us. It's certainly my pleasure. This has been really quite an experience. Uh, You know, I had this idea back in January. I started pitching it to our team of jewelry specialists as they were going out and collecting jewels for the sale in December. Uh, that I thought this would be a fantastic thing to celebrate King Tutankhamun's discovery since it was 100 years. It always brings a little bit of extra added interest and dimension to the auctions, which tend to feature the large, important diamonds and colored stones. And this is really something more historical along the lines of storytelling. Um, which I always try to promote in every sale. And actually, you just showed me, um, just before we started, the cover of the National Geographic magazine, which has a full page. It's The cover is 
Tutankhamun himself. And it just is incredible that um, since Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon found this tomb packed full of treasures from the zenith of Egypt's golden age, it just had this incredible global impact, didn't it? I mean, he became like the most famous cover star in the world. And he still is today. Still drawing crowds, still having television programs made about him, books written about him. It's really quite extraordinary. Everyone knows King Tut. Uh, it's become a, a symbol of strength and virility for men. I mean, it's really exceptional. It is. I think that mask actually is as recognizable as any Western masterpiece in the mind of people, don't you think? Absolutely. Um, I think he's the sort of emblem of the exoticism and opulence of Egyptian jewellery. And one thing that I was interested in, that in effect, you know, in all the, the programmes made about him and at the time, that I think when Howard Carter first found the tomb, they were just amazed at how small it was and they just couldn't believe that this was a tomb for an important pharaoh because he was so young. No one knew at that time quite how young he was. He was 19. So the fact that he's got this reputation as the most famous pharaoh that there was isn't really about what he did. It's about what he left don't you think? Well, it's it's in part that we have what he left. Uh, there were other pharaohs. For example, Ramses II, who uh, came after Tutankhamun. There is a show right now in San Francisco, an all uh, immersive, you can have an immersive video experience, but they also have fantastic sculptures and jewelry from that period on view. And it's really mind boggling at what they were able to achieve, you know, in that time, so many thousands of years ago, the technical expertise in creating these these objects. They had very simple tools, didn't they? Well, very simple tools, but as far as we know, they're still continuing to excavate and find new information and discover the techniques for the jewelry making and the sculpture, the pyramid building, but, but also for mummification. So all these, you know, what they didn't know when they found King Tut, they are adding to now. In effect, it was the sort of power of the jewelry made by these master craftsmen who worked for him that have really catapulted him into the, the most famous pharaoh of all time. Well, for us, he's the most famous pharaoh because we have what he was buried with. For many of the pharaohs before him and those after, the tombs were often robbed. And so we don't know to the extent of what treasures those other pharaohs had, but we do know what he had. And what he had was quite extraordinary. And from what I understand, because I say I'm not an Egyptologist, but it was a rather hasty preparation for his tomb. It is all, was all sort of jammed into one little space. Um, all of these wonderful treasures, you know, beds, couches, his walking sticks. And he carried so many walking sticks because he had a, a malformation of his foot. But there were, as I say, so many beautiful walking sticks and other things to aid him. He had everything he needed to walk into that afterlife. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So he had breastplates, heart pendants made from carnelian, blue glass, gold beads, rings, bangles, pectorals, amulets, collars. I mean, it, he was just really bedecked, wasn't he? Absolutely, with the scarabs wrapped around the, the linen of the mummy wrappings, just every imaginable rich you could think of or that you could want. Um, beautifully decorated swords and sword hilts. In fact, one which is going to be on view when they show it, uh, what they discovered that is the, the blade itself is made from a meteor. Really? Yes. That's extraordinary. So you have, this is a sword that will be shown alongside the jewellery. It's a dagger, and the dagger blade is made from meteoric material from the heavens. So with the sale, you'll have some Egyptian pieces from the period on show. Yes, we will. In the Magnificent Jewels section, we have about eight pieces altogether, and then we have another tier of sale fine jewels with other, um, well, let's say, lower price points. The things that are in the Magnificent Jewels sale are there for a specific reason. For example, the fantastic micro-mosaic necklace with scarabs 
by Castellani, which was made about 1860, along with a brooch. Those were both in the Castellani's private collection and were sold with a sale of Alfredo Castellani's jewelry in 1930. So it has a wonderful provenance. But the unusual thing is that Castellani, being Italian jewelers, were really focused on the gold work of the ancients and the things that were being discovered in Etruria coming out of these ancient tombs. But they did, by comparison, fewer pieces of Egyptian revival. Of course, they were known for their work in micro mosaic. And when you take a look at these pieces online, you'll see that with the micro mosaic, the small little tesserae, glass tesserae, you have to almost see with a magnifying lens because typically in a square inch, there can be as many as 2,000 tesserae. So that's quite minute. And what set them apart also with their master mosaicist, whose name was Luigi Poggio, uh, was the insertion of little cloisons. You'll see in the brooch, there are along the wings, outlines of the feathers in gold wire. Most other mosaicists would skip that step. So it's really quite refined. Uh, way of doing micro mosaic, uh, and they excelled at it. And these are very rare, exceedingly rare. As I say, um, you will find more Greek revival, Etruscan revival than you will Egyptian revival by Castellani, and certainly surviving to this day. So, what do you think provoked him to do that Egyptian revival? I think, for all the reasons you discussed, with the onset of the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, and the Empress Eugenie having various parties celebrating what was going on in Egypt at the moment, they rose to the occasion because, as you say, Egyptomania had taken hold and was sweeping all over Europe and America as well. And actually, I think you've got a Louis Comfort Tiffany pendant necklace. And I love the story about that party to celebrate that when it was first created. This is really something that I like. I do like to talk about because I've handled a number of pieces by Louis Comfort Tiffany. Um, in fact, we just last December sold his, one of his masterpieces. But for him, I think he owed a great deal to the Egyptian culture. He w went to Paris in the late 1860s to study at university as a young man and had spent many years touring in Egypt, um, doing watercolors of the pyramids and that sort of thing. And it was then I think he probably first encountered their extraordinary abilities in glass making. And when you think about it, uh, what did he do? He began making glass, stained glass windows, pot vessels made out of glass. And of course, his first early pieces of that would relate to Egypt were the fevril glass scarabs, or those iridescent blue scarabs. But it was in, I think, around 1908 or 1910 that he had taken a trip to Egypt with his chief designer, Julia Munson. And shortly thereafter, he decided that he was going to make a series of jewels in Egyptian revival style. This is a period in time when the themes in jewelry were beginning to shift uh, to a more modular, modern sort of sensibility, something to which he was completely opposed. When you look at the body of his work, early work in jewelry, it's very floral, based on nature. And then there's this shift in 1913 to do Egyptian revival. So he has a party in the um, Tiffany and Company showroom, and it's a dress party. Everyone has to come in costume. He dresses as Pasha, and it's quite an elaborate affair. There were Nubians coming in with a rolled up carpets, and out of the carpet came Ruth Saint-Denis, who was the fabulous dancer of the day, doing her exotic dance, and they were recreating the scene of Antony and Cleopatra returning to Alexandria. It was quite an event. So we don't see many pieces of Louis Comfort Tiffany from this Egyptian period that often in the market. So having one come up uh, is really extraordinary and quite unusual. So, you know, I was really pleased that we could have it for the sale because it's quite striking. And it's actually, as one of the, my clients has said on The View, you know, it's really very wearable. It's something that you could wear with blue jeans or you could wear with a, a beautiful evening gown. Either way, it's fantastic. So it's a multi-strand, I think two or three strands of colored beads with gold beads and it centers upon a stylized scarab ornament in the center with cobras lining the scarab form. And that is very like a manat that the pharaohs were buried with. Well, the manat um, was oh. a specific type of necklace. It had at the back a counterbalance. Now, I was suggesting in my footnote that perhaps that was the source of inspiration for this design, where he turned the counterbalance to the front, 
because in the back it's just a little knot, gold knot mm-hmm. clasp at the back. But it might have been his modern interpretation of, of that. It might have been. Yeah. And certainly King Tutankhamun would have had a manat. But the majority of Egyptian jewellery was based on symbolism, wasn't it? It had this meaning and depth. It was about really how to how to get to the afterlife, wasn't it? The scarab beetle represented, in a sense, eternity, and the winged scarab enabled it to lift itself up and fly to the sun in celebration of that life thereafter. So it held very strong importance to the ancient Egyptians. And of course, gold was thought to be an extraordinary medium and the skin of the gods. So that's why you have a mask with gold and inlaid stones. And a lot of amulets representing sort of animals, deities, symbols. Right. They believed in a magical power being transferred onto them. Absolutely. We do have a bracelet that was made about 1870 by a French jeweler named Emile Desiré Philippe, and it is composed of hard stone scarabs for the bracelet. It's mounted entirely in gold, and it's supporting charms that are these elements that relate, it's, there's an ankh, what's known as the jed pillar that stands for stability, and also the nefer amulet, which signifies beauty. And it's very interesting that he had chosen to do this all in gold because we've seen other examples by him that are pastiches of different materials, mostly in silver and some gold, but this is an extraordinary bracelet and it's all gold. I think you quoted in the catalogue of the sale that he would have consulted an Egyptologist before he designed and created that piece. Some of these jewelers were very learned men. They were not just craftsmen. So they were interested to do research and learn about what it was that was inspiring them to make something. So he had to know a little bit about what these symbols represented. And so he would have handled those pieces himself. He would have at least been exposed to them and seen them. Because when an artisan goes about designing something, his source of inspiration has to come from somewhere. So he's probably seen them, and most likely read about them. And from what I understand, he did connect with Egyptologists and read. So there you have it. And you also talk about the importance of the Rosetta Stone in a key to understanding Egyptian jewellery. Could you just tell us a little about the importance of that? Well, the decipherment of the uh, of the hieroglyphics in, in Egyptian art and jewellery was significant. That was a major breakthrough. And again, I'm not an Egyptologist, so I don't have all the facts and figures. Um, but what I do know is that um, oftentimes, unlike Emile Philippe, other artists would take um, hieroglyphics and blend them into a pastiche of figures that really made no sense to the ancient Egyptians in the way they were all assembled. They were just copying the the pictograms, making an untranslatable dialogue. (laughs) For example, in the fabulous Le Cloche bracelet, that we have, there's a scene of what looks to be a walking pharaoh and a seated scribe with other figures, but it's really up to you to try and figure out what story is being told, because it's unclear. (laughs) They're just icons that everyone understands. There's a winged figure of the sun, as as I mentioned, the Aten, up in the corner, and then there is a crook and a flail. Those are the instruments that the pharaoh would hold. And then two figures on either side of the bracelet of the goddess Nekbet, who would see you into the afterlife. So she was important. She was. But I think I've seen a Van Cleef bracelet where the hieroglyphics were accurate and were telling a specific story in rubies, sapphires, emeralds, and diamonds. So they obviously had had an Egyptologist to translate. Exactly. And in fact, when I talk about Cartier, they had been experimenting with Egyptian-inspired designs as early as 1913 or so. This is when you begin to get the geometric-shaped diamonds, such as the triangular, the baguette, and so on. But it isn't until this the discovery of King Tut's tomb that Louis Cartier decides that he's going to use these faience fragments, ancient Egyptian faience fragments that he has in his collection, which he had acquired from a dealer, and he was going to mount them into beautiful platinum, diamond, and onyx settings. In the Cartier exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum in the 90s, there was in the catalog a mention and a black and white photograph of a semicircular shaped brooch. The centerpiece was an ancient piece of faience with hieroglyphics, and what what Cartier had done on the back, uh, which was all gold, was the inscription was translated into English so that you knew it was talking about the mayor of Thebes 
this Mentu Emhat uh, and all of his accomplishments fully translated in English on the back. So that's what separates Cartier from the others in that he was using actual Egyptian faience fragments and really telling a story. It was extraordinary because the, the whereabouts of it had been unknown once it was sold out of stock in 1924, I believe. And so there it was one day sitting on my desk. And so it was a great pleasure to bring this to the world, which had been, you know, obscured since the 1920s. <laughs> he really wanted to distance himself from the competitors, didn't he? As you said, the ones who sort of were doing a sort of like Egyptian idea, and he thought it lacked archaeological authenticity. And actually, the pieces that he created, as you said, using the the old objects, the old files, they could have come straight out of King Tut's tomb. Obviously came out of somewhere in the region near the pharaohs, who knows, but they were definitely ancient uh, fragments. There was one, um, one of the Cartier pieces with a scarab brooch with diamond and onyx lotus surround was formerly in the collection of French Egyptologist Gaston Maspero. So obviously it had that provenance, it's sort of straight out of a tomb into an archaeologist's hands and then into Cartier, which is extraordinary. Reincarnated, if you will, into a uh, modern... Rebirth. Into a modern jewel. Of course. Yes. <laughs> and actually they had, um, you were talking about the exhibition in 1913, they had a lot of these jewels and it said in the catalogue, Today, fashion decrees that the elegant Parisienne should wear ancient jewellery and not merely stale imitations, but the very jewels themselves that once adorned the bosom of an Egyptian queen or a Greek empress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that put their competitors in their place. Exactly. Didn't it? I'd like to talk a little bit about another piece which uses an ancient fragment, but in a very different way, which is known as the desert brooch. It was designed by F. Walter Lawrence, who was an arts and crafts jeweler uh, in the Midwest. And he had begun designing this about 1901, together with his craftsperson, uh, Gustav Mons, who was very skilled in creating jewelry, in fact, had many firms who used him to create some of their jewels, Tiffany, Van Cleef, a number of others. And basically, he had supplied this ancient glass fragment to create this brooch. The glass fragment was supplied by a well-known dealer named Aziz Kayat, and probably on one of Gustav Manz's trips in Egypt, because he did um, go on excavations there. He was also associated with the Metropolitan Museum in New York. came up with this idea to create this fabulous brooch and is actually framed by a sort of stylized series of palm trees. And it is really a caravan of camels with a rider in the distance you know, heading towards the pyramid complex at Giza. And then the backdrop is this piece of glass. And when you light it from the back, when it's backlit this way, it makes like the desert sky at night. It's really quite phenomenal. He had exhibited it in uh, 1903 at several crafts fairs. And it was actually even published uh, by Town & Country magazine that same year. Uh, he exhibited also the same brooch at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. So it had a, a, a great cataloging and provenance. Uh, but again, as with the Cartier piece, the whereabouts of it were unknown since it was actually sold at that time until very recently. It surfaced and the piece is actually not signed, but we know it's the same piece because it's fully described in this town and country article with a black and white photograph. So it's really Amazing. quite extraordinary to have that all come together. And I knew of it for about two years. And when I had this idea for us to go ahead and do a section of Egyptian themed jewels, I said, this really needs to have the visibility raised on it because it's quite an important piece of American jewelry as well. What is the um, estimate for it? Well, frankly, uh, it's really quite reasonable at ten to 15,000. And actually, Gustav Mann's uh, great granddaughters are alive today, and they provided a lot of this information to me from the materials that they had surviving from their great grandfather. And just the, uh, it was over the weekend, she sent me the entry form for uh, F. Walter Lawrence and this brooch. And the, I think the sale price at that time was $350, <laughs> which is about <laughs> what it is in value today for what we're offering it. So I do expect that it should fetch well more than that. And I would really love to see it go to an institution, if not a private collector who will loan it for institutions. 
uh, because it, it's an extraordinary piece. Amazing. And so anyone who's in New York right now should go and have a look at that while they can. I, I was thinking, um, because of all the grave robbers and because Howard Carter knew that somebody had been into Tutankhamun's tomb before him, because they dropped things amongst the rubble. Plus, he came back to London at some point, didn't he, with 24 pieces of jewellery, which he gave out to friends. I mean, there could be actual pieces of King Tutankhamun's funerary jewellery that come onto the market from time to time. Well, that would that would be um, extraordinary if they were able to be identified, but I don't yes. know if those were ever catalogued in any sort of fashion, you know, to be able to prove that that's the provenance that they actually came from the tomb. I don't I don't know how you'd go about sorting that out and wouldn't Egypt want those back? <laughs> well, I think they want the Rosetta Stone back for a start. They want a lot of you. things back, yeah. <laughs> well, but it's sort of great now in all the um, documentaries and articles now that are written about it that the Egyptians who were digging to find this now have had the due attention and glory that they should have had in finding this, not just Howard Carter. Right. Well, I think this celebration of the opening of the Grand Museum in Cairo is what's putting it front and center on the map once again and bringing them a whole new level of mm. respect and notoriety. Yes. I mean, around the but world, people are going to be flocking to see these treasures as they already have before, now there's more to see. Talking about the, some of the jewellery that you've got on show, which is you know from the 19th century, you quote a line in a French exhibition in 1994 titled Egyptomania. Jean-Michel Humbert, the curator, who said, it's not enough to recreate and copy Egyptian forms. They must create them in the cauldron of their own sensibility and context of their times. Very much so. It was the Louvre Museum in association with the National Museum in Ottawa, Canada, who put together this exhibition of Egyptomania, if you will. And I think Humbert really hit the nail on the head when he said that, because when you think of Art Deco jewelry and how does that apply to the forms and symbols of ancient Egypt? Well, they took diamonds, colored stones, and the modern use of platinum to express these Egyptian ideas, which is, again, using them in the cauldron of their own sensibility and their own time to bring about something that's referring to thousands of years ago. So really quite interesting. I thought his explanation warranted quoting. <laughs> yes, and it's a sort of collision of two huge artistic movements of the Egyptian and Art Deco coming together. In an extraordinarily something. new way. And the La Cloche Frere that you have um, does that, doesn't it? Very much so. I mean, that's what, I, that's what I'm talking about because that's from the period of 1925, the famous Paris exhibition where you saw a plethora of these Egyptian-themed jewels uh, on view. So it's quite extraordinary. But from what I understand, La Cloche only made perhaps maybe three or four of these panel bracelets, so it's exceedingly rare. We just don't see them in the marketplace. And who's going to buy them? Um, a very sophisticated collector, I think one who can appreciate all the things that we've discussed about them. The fact that they're rare, they're beautiful, they're in great condition, they're from the major one of the major houses. So I would like to see, if it is a private collector, that I do make every effort to see if these things can be exhibited as I did with the Castellani pieces, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in 2017 to 2018 did an exhibition of revivalist jewels. And I happened to know the curator and I knew the person who had purchased the necklace and the brooch before. And I put them together and it was a beautiful thing because these were on view to the public for about a year. Rather than see them just sit in a drawer or go in a bank vault, they really need to be exposed. And that's a great way to do it. So if it's not an institution that buys it, mm -hmm. it is a private collector. I like to match them up uh, with exhibitions that do take place. And are there any contemporary jewelers now that you see doing revivalist Egyptian work that you admire? Well, yes. Uh, we have done a showcase, and just recently in London, of Beautiful in Black uh, with our black designers. Mm, and there is mm. one, Angie Murray, M-A-R-E-I. Mm -hmm. She does a line called Pharaoh uh, and takes uh, inspiration from not only Egyptian art, but architecture, uh, which I find very fascinating. 
very simplified, beautiful forms, the snake or the cobra, the serpent form and architectural motif. So that's one that comes to mind immediately. So it's still happening. Still happening. The ancient myth will, will still, still appear in different continues. It continues. Absolutely. And what are the other pieces of ancient Egypt that you'll have on show with the jewelry? Uh, well, uh, I had the good fortune to come across a an, an ancient gold coin of Queen Arsinoe II. She was a Ptolemaic queen of the area of Syria, the, the Ptolemies, and it dates to about 4th, 3rd century BC. She also became Pharaoh. She was actually wow. Pharaoh and referred to as queen, a king of Upper and Lower Egypt, just as was Chepsut back in the day. So um, quite important coin mounted by none other than our lovable Verdura in New York. Although he's long past, he did do some ancient coins during the 1940s. Uh, people would bring things in and he would mount them up. In the book on Verdura, you'll find other examples of these ancient coins. But I thought it was extraordinary to come across this at this moment when we're doing hmm. Egyptian to talk about Arsinoe II. And do you think that the luxury and magnificence of ancient Egypt in the pieces and in the revival, do you think it's been matched by any other civilization in the ongoing inspiration in jewelry? You know, with the Castellani, you know, using micro mosaic, obviously the Castellani took their color palette from the Egyptians, but in using micro mosaic, that was something new and different that you probably wouldn't find in ancient Egyptian jewelry. Now, when I went to see the Ramses exhibition, they did have jewelry on view, but what really struck me was their technical abilities to do inlay work, quite extraordinary. There is a jeweler of the Gem Palace, his name is Munu. I remember Munu. Yes, and Munu did a, a copy of the necklace that's in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, all in different, it was gold with lapis, if I recall, two colors of blue, quite extraordinary, but based on a necklace from ancient Egypt that they have there. So very stunning reinvention of a truly ancient form. Because so much of that ancient jewelry really looks quite modern now, doesn't it? It's it's striking. Mm. It, it, I really have to emphasize that people should go out when they have an opportunity like this and really take a good look. I remember when I first saw the cover mask of Tutankhamun when he came, was here in San Francisco in 2007. And what struck me was their abilities with the glass making. If they didn't have the exact cut or, of colored stone, they would use glass and match it perfectly. Really just psh, blow your mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. and the, the technical abilities, uh, that's what struck me the most. In addition to the piece we have by Louis Comfort Tiffany, later in the sale, there are two what would really be termed as our nouveau pieces. One is a pendant necklace set with an opal, and it has small stones around with what's known as plique azure enamel. It's enamel where the light shines through. Also a ring and a bracelet. Now, in these pieces are all published in Tiffany's books on uh, Lewis Comfort Tiffany. And John Loring, the former director, referred to them as Neo-Egyptian in their coloration. And they weren't technically, you don't look at them and say, oh, this, this reminds me of ancient Egypt. But when you do think about it, uh, yes, that could have been a source of inspiration for him in creating these. So I just mentioned those because they do come up in a, later in the sale in a different section. But Clearly, this is another aspect of what he was doing before he got to 1913. These were made earlier, around 1910, I want to say. I didn't realize how really challenging it would be to assemble a series of Egyptian-style jewels. And I opened it up to any period, be it 19th century to today, um, and, and it's very hard to, to find them because they have mostly been collected <laughs> and people don't want to let go of them. <laughs> so here's a good opportunity for people to take a look and get their hands on a on a piece of ancient And even for Egyptian. designers, I have a few designers who do like to come to the exhibitions uh, to see these things, not only for the forms as a source of inspiration, but the techniques used in making them. So that's an interesting thing for people to enjoy. Well, thank you so much, Carol. Thank you for giving us a little preview. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome, and I thank you for having me. I just want to share with you my little cameo. I don't know if you can see her. It's Pharaoh. Oh, it's Pharaoh. Oh, my God. I believe it is Hatshepsut. 
<laughs> it's Hatshepsut. It's Hatshepsut. And who was it made by? Uh, unsigned, English, probably unsigned. about 1870, 1880. And then I have these little pharaoh earrings on. And who made those? Uh, well, these are actually costume, uh, but I love this. This is from the 1930s, so this would be straight out of Egyptomania. Well, actually, actually, they're later, from the 50s. A company called ART, Art, and they did mm -hmm. a series of these. So you can find, you know, fun it's, things out there. It's like Tutankhamun's mask in the center. <laughs> exactly. Of I couldn't in resist. The center of sort of gold <laughs> triangles. Amazing. Mm -hmm. But I love your hat chet suit. Yeah. She was a very strong um, mm -hmm. female leader, yeah. wasn't she? She was pharaoh, you know. Mm, she was pharaoh. She was pharaoh. So. And what I never realized was that Nefertiti was Tutankhamun's stepmom. Stepmom, exactly. Mm. I mean, see, all this they're discovering through DNA and these mm. other technological advances that weren't available when he first came out of the tomb. So, oh. you know, this is extraordinary things that they're discovering and continue, you know, it's ongoing. I can't wait for the Grand um, Cairo Egyptian Museum to open. It'll be amazing, won't it? I, yes, absolutely. I remember I had given a lecture on glyptic art, um, engraved gems, and my it is a little seminar for jewelry people, if you will. And my colleague was also giving a talk on techniques of gem engraving. And fu very funny, we both had chosen the same pectoral ornament from King Tut's tomb in our lecture to talk about it. And he went up first and gave his talk. And when he got to the slide, someone asked him what the scarab material was in the center. And he said, oh, I think it's some sort of green quartz or whatever. And, you know, I know him very well. He's a good friend. And so he didn't mind, but I just had to. I, when it came my turn, I said, I'm sorry to have the same slide as my colleague, but I will talk about it a little bit more about the scarab in the center because they they didn't know what the material was uh, when it first came out of the tomb exactly. Um, and there was, at some point in the 1930s, I think it was, a mineralogist had been driving over this dry lake bed on the border of Egypt and Libya. And it was cra crackling and crunching as he went along. And there were these pieces of this green glass-like material. Well, it wasn't until I think it was the 70s or 80s that the scientists got a hold of it and analyzed it, that in fact, this is a, sil a, a, a form of silica that had been fused together through the crash of a meteorite. Here we go with the meteorites again. Um, and it was exceedingly, exceedingly rare this very strange greenish yellow color. So having come from the heavens, this material. Going back. It was chosen as a very centerpiece to carve a scarab out of for his pectoral ornament. I mean, really quite extraordinary. So it's not just there for no reason. It's there for a specific reason. Very rare, and it came from the sky or it was forged by something coming from the sky. So that linking them, you know, to the to the heavens. Amazing. And pectorals were really only for the pharaoh, weren't yes, they? Yes, yes. No one would be walking around that grand. <laughs> no. And people were just buried with their finest jewellery, weren't they? Mm -hmm. I mean, always, because you, that's you can take how it with they would you. be a pharaoh <laughs> in the afterlife, wouldn't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. Wanted to have all everything. Mm -hmm. Everything you'd need to drink, to eat, mm -hmm. to wear, to sleep, to hunt, you know, to fish, whatever. It would be all there for you. Quite comforting. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. No, I really appreciate absolute it. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for listening. For this and other episodes of If Jewels Could Talk, please go to our website, carolwalton.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast feed and please leave us a rating and a comment. Join me again next week when we'll continue our excavation of Egyptian jewellery. As we mentioned, many jewellers have remained enthralled to the pharaohs and we will be talking about how jewellers now combine this ancient civilization with modernity. Please join us then. Goodbye. If Jewels Could Talk with Carol Wilton is produced by Natasha Cowan, music and editing by Tim Thornton, graphics by Scott Bentley, illustration by Geordie Labanda and you can find me on Instagram at Carol Walton. <laughs>